words are weird. Words are weird. And that is why you like them. Hello and welcome to Lexitecture, a podcast about word origins and histories. My name is Ryan, and in each episode my friend Amy and I bring a new pair of words to share their stories with each other and you. You can find our past episodes and the occasional blog post on our website at lexitecture.com, follow along with us on Twitter and Facebook at Lexitecture, and if you really like what we do, you can support the show at patreon.com slash lexitecture. Today's episode, Basic Harvest. So, speaking of words, should we dive right in? Let us word. Um, actually, before we word, we have, thanks to offer, we have a new Patreon patron. Oh, that's subs- super awesome. Some subscriber Anyway, that was too far. Um, her name is Joy. subscriber Yeah, that is yeah, too far. It is too much. Madness. That was silly. Let's just forget that ever happened. Um... <laughs> So our new Patreon patron is named Joy, and she is a calligrapher from France who has been um, enthusiastically communicating her desire to write us fancy worded and lettered postcards and stuff. So we will be getting uh, a post office box here in Canada that people can send stuff to, including for for no Joy. other reason than that we we want we want postcards from from Joy. Pretty That's much. That's basically it, and, but but everyone else as well. Oh yeah, yeah, like this pe- is things not, from no, people. We, we, we're in no way, um, ex- no, exclusive. Yeah, yeah, there's no exclusivity here. It's uh, the There's fact. a lot of inclusivity here. Yeah. Anyone who likes can, uh, can write us beautiful letters. Yeah. And, and also that. anyone who likes can subscribe to us on and support us on Patreon, like yeah. Joy did, because she's awesome. What's, uh, what's better than being called Joy? It's such a lovely name. It is. Although it does always remind me of the Flannery O'Connor story. Do do you know this story? I always forget what it's called. And it's about a woman who, an an adult woman who lives with her mother and she has a wooden leg. Hmm. No, you're not familiar with the story. It's it's really famous, but um, so famous I can't remember what it's called. And in the story, the woman who has the wooden leg was christened Joy. But she was so, she hated her name so much that right. as soon as she was able to, she changed it. And what she changed it to was Hulga. <laughs> so nice. basically, she, uh, she hated the idea that her name should be inherently happy. And so as a, a reflex against this, changed it to the ugliest sounding name she could possibly think of. Nice. Um, so so the name Joy always kind of makes me think of Hulga and how I'd much rather be called Joy than be called Hulga. Yeah, that's fair. But I mean, no offence to any Hulgas out there. I, I, I've i never seen it in the wild, that name. Um, I've never I'd heard of that in the wild. I'd be very surprised to come across it. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, thanks, Joy. You sound awesome. Yeah. Flannery O'Connor is just about the most Irish name you could possibly imagine. Yeah, yeah it's American. <laughs> I mean, who's more Irish than the Americans? Nobody's more Irish than the Americans. Yeah. <laughs> you don't see any rivers getting dyed green in Dublin. Is all I'm going to say about that. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> right. Um, okay. Words. Um, do you want to go first, or do you want me to go first this time? And I will totally go first. I just okay. need a second to get my tabs in order. Okay, let's get those tabs in order. Which is not a thing I ever thought I'd say out loud, but but there we go. That's it's a thing I just said. I mean, to be fair, I think I've heard you say that before. <laughs> yeah, it's probably true. Like, I mean, as a person who knows generally what my brain is like and what my personality is like, I I feel like you know what my tab organization is like. I have a vague sense. I I have enough of a sense that I know that the the word organization there is doing some pretty heavy lifting. <laughs> it's kind of uh, weird. Yeah, yeah, that's that's entirely fair. <laughs> it's like and you're I'm filing. Just, that's that's all we need to say. That's yeah. that's the end. Yeah. Yeah. The other day, I realized I had twenty two tabs open on my phone, and it's a fair bit. Decided I had to get a grip of my life. <laughs> 
And, and in fairness, quite often when I have that many tabs open in my phone, it's because I'm researching a word. And well, it's a good reason. Thanks to the, the wonders of the internet, I, I can do that on my phone, which is nice because I am the sort of human being who will halfway through, you know, a, an activity think, so why is that word spelled that way? And mm. the fact that I can answer that question almost instantaneously brings me such delight that I on I almost can't communicate it. Um, yeah, so, that's neat. So tabs get popped up, but I'm also, I realised the other day I, I had a, a terrible migraine, which okay. which sucked a bit. Yeah. But um, I realised that it was because I'd been sitting looking at a screen for about nine hours without any right. breaks. <laughs> right, yeah. That'll because, do it. Because, yeah, currently I'm trying to learn um, things Things Amy is trying to learn. Photoshop. Okay. General Adobe Creative Cloud stuff. Yeah. Uh, I'm reading a book about marketing, a subject which comes as naturally to me as, um, <laughs> I don't know, standing on one leg while juggling knives. Um, <laughs> I'm also trying to learn about um, foot anatomy because there's always more to learn about all of these things right. and um, general functional anatomy stuff and I'm trying to learn about web design and video production so right. there's not that much space in my head right now for, for many other things <laughs> but 22 tabs based on all that jazz yeah. seem to me like quite a sort of a reasonable number <laughs> but I mean in time, context sure 22 is too many get your life sorted out 22 is a lot. Okay, I think now the tabs are all in order. Okay. Do you want to go first or will I? Uh, well, you've got your tabs in order now, so why don't you just... <laughs> let's just keep going. I'm having a bit of an exciting one where I don't know which one to talk about first. Oh, this is always the, the fun with having I mean, two. It's, it's, it's rare that this happens. Do you this want me to start and then you can, you can ha use that as a, a jumping off point? See no, no, which no, one no, grabs I'm you? Gonna, no, I'm, I'm going to just get right in there. Okay. This is a word that I first started researching, God, ages ago. I had it in my pocket um, to do a double episode where you didn't have time to do a double episode. And I've, I've been right. hanging on to it since then. Nice. And the word is basic. Oh, cool. B-A-S-I-C, quite simply. And... What I discovered, first of all, about the word basic, I actually... I, I don't remember why it is that I first started looking at this word, first got interested in this word, because it was a while ago. Mm -hmm. But I found it to be, it, it was one of these where I kind of thought, oh, I bet this word is, pardon the pun, pretty ordinary. Mm. And it, it turned out to be, I thought, incredibly interesting. So it is, of course, an adjective. And the adjective comes from the noun base. Right. So off I went, off I trotted to the OED with a small skip in my step, because you know how I love the OED. Naturally. And I discovered uh, base, noun one, two, three, four, Ooh. five, six, and seven. I also discovered base verb, one, two, three, <laughs> four. I feel like when you do those lists, there should be like crescendoing applause, like in The Price is Right, when like a, no a person's getting closer and closer to jackpot. One, two, whoa, whoa, type of thing. <laughs> so um, I feel like The Price is Right is not such a culturally ingrained thing over my side of the pond. Probably but not. I, I do know what you're talking about. You know, I have, I've obviously I've seen it. I'm aware of it. And there used to be a British version. Oh, really? Um, but yeah, I, I I genuinely wasn't expecting so much bass. Yeah. Pretty much. And I should all point out base. that all of these senses are B-A-S-E. There are no variant spellings. That's that's not something that we're getting into at this point. Right. Seven noun senses and four verb senses. So without further ado or a don't, here they all are. <laughs> the first one noun one, which is originally cited around about 1335, okay. is generally speaking, this kind of collection of, of meanings falls under the heading of a lowest or supporting part. 
Hmm. All right. So we're thinking about, as in architecture, the bit of a column between the bottom of the shaft and the top of the pedestal or between the shaft and the pavement. In other words, the, the square thing or the round thing that a column sits upon. Right. We then have the, the pedestal of a statue or a cross or anything else you want to put up on a pedestal. Okay. That sense comes from about 1450. And in building, the lowest course of masonry of a wall or similar structure, that comes from about 1726. Um, we, we then get a, a second architecture sense, the plinth and mouldings, which form the slightly projecting part at the bottom of the wall of a room. That's from, fifth, sorry, from 1757. Right. And then we get a supporting socket, which is both obsolete and rare. It comes from 1380 and a text called Serferumbras. I don't know about you, but I want to know more about Serferumbras just yeah. because that's an awesome name. It is the only citation for this particular um, meaning, which is which is always pretty cool. Yeah. We then get in a person or in an animal or in a plant the the end of a part or organ by which it is attached to the main part, trunk or stem. So you can have the base of a leaf stalk you mm. can have the base of a thumb you can have the base of a hair where it joins the skin and right. this sense comes from about 1425 in maths a fourth sense we can consider mm. the line or surface of a plane or solid figure on which it's regarding as regarded as standing mm. and this sense comes from about 1556 so i'm i'm just i'm going here through the the oed numbered listings rather than putting them into chronological order right um but but we can see, you know, there's there's, there's a lot to, to talk about here. There's a lot to think about. Yeah. Uh, sense five, we've got heraldry, the lower part of a shield, um, the width of a bar or the fifth part of the shield's height, separated off from the bottom by a horizontal line. Who would have thought that heraldry would have an oddly specific definition for something <laughs> that you didn't even know had a name? It's so out of context. It's yeah, so out it of just character. doesn't sound Weird. like those guys at all. Yeah, no. <laughs> Jeez. And then we get to, um, in gunnery, the rear part of the breech of a cannon. Isn't this lovely? Especially the, the protuberant part, including the cascabel. Ooh. Cascabel just sounds... Cascabel actually sounds like the name of a princess to me. Yes. But uh, instead, it's a part yeah. of a gun. We've then got, uh, in terms of fortification, an imaginary line connecting the salient angle of two adjacent bastions. That's from around about 1691. In printing, the lowest part of a letter that rests on the line. That's from 1827. Mm -hmm. In linguistics, the simple form from which the derivatives and inflected forms of a word arise. Right. The uninflected or unaffixed form of a word. So the theme or base of a word. Um. In a junction transistor, the electrode by which the input current enters. And then there's a whole section, star, more general senses. Oh. The okay. bottom of any object, when considered as its support or as the part on which the upper part stands or rests, or a surface on which a person or thing stands, grows or moves. This sense comes again all the way back about around about 1390 perhaps even 1350 there's some doubt there about the date and um and a whole sense of of further um definitions that that relate to the sense of of the thing on which another thing is supported or is built right um, then we have the idea of a significant or a basic substance. So a, a main, the main ingredient of something, the main element to which other things are added. So um, from about 1550, we get a, a compendium of alchemy that nice. has, uh, you know, talking about the idea of gold as a base. And then we get chemistry. Of course, the sense of basic or a base in chemistry is... Any subject, any substance, typically a metallic oxide, hydroxide, or carbonate, or an alkaloid that's able to neutralize and be neutralized by acids, forming mm. salts. This is uh, from about from sorry from 1727, which is quite old in chemistry terms. Yeah. Um, and in biochemistry, a little bit later in 1893, we get any of the compounds related to purine or pyrimidine, which occur as residues in nucleic acids and nucleotides. Man, I love science. 
I don't know what those <laughs> words mean, but man, they sound fancy. They are neat. All good. We have a substance used as a fixant or a mordant for dyes. We have photography, the material which is coated with a light sensitive substance to make film. A substance used on the skin before the application of other cosmetics. May I remind you, we're only on NAMN 1 at this point. We're Good into grief. section 3 of, <laughs> uh, of, of senses. So we next Jeez. get a significant or a secure location and all of the various contexts that we right, see there. Yeah. We're on definition number 90, almost 19. And we'll get to definition 21 before we even get to phrasal uses. Just grief. So the, this is a, a hard working word. Yeah. Now, to, to, to quickly skip through the, the other noun senses, a lot of these are, are obsolete or they're, they're a very specific usage. Right. But we have noun to base, the perch, fish. So usually spelled B-A-S-S these days. Uh, a, a wonderful... A wonderful variant on that is the word bars, B-A-R-S-E. Oh. Which, again, just, just means the perch, the fish, but made me giggle a little bit because bars is the word that one of my friends uses. It's sort of a Scottish equivalent to taint. <laughs> now, again, he would also talk about the tisney. Tisney is a variant of taint. Oh, Okay. For for those of much cleaner dispositions than, than Ryan and I, your taint, it taint your bum and it taint your bits. Tisney, tisney your arse, tisney your balls. And bars is a portmanteau word of balls and arse. There you go. So if you want to get technical about it, it's referring to the perineum. But bars did make me laugh, even though it's talking about a fish in this particular case. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm just not ever going to get any more mature than this. Live <laughs> we're, with it. We're grown-ups. <laughs> we are grown-ups. We regularly are in charge of other people. <laughs> yeah, that's weird and unsettling. Next, we've got base, as we get it in the sense of, eventually, baseball. But the, the, the game of base, specifically prisoner's base or prisoner's bars, it's sometimes called, uh, is first cited in 1440, Long before oh, baseball wow. comes comes into comes into play, yeah. Pardon the pun, um, and yeah, the idea of playing base is one that we see all the way through the fifteenth, sixteenth, seventeenth, eighteenth, nineteenth centuries, um, hmm. up to the twentieth century. Uh, we played base in the yard. This idea of um, of a, a game where there's a sort of a sense of a place that you are trying to run to, right. Quite a specific usage for that one. Then we get, now historical, um, an item of dress or part of one. Oh. So the skirt of a woman's outer petticoat or robe, a pleated skirt of cloth, velvet or rich brocade appended to the doublet, common in the Tudor period and often worn with armour. Uh, we have apron and perhaps the idea of a, a housing. So a thing where you would put another thing. Hmm. You can see that this that that this sense is not a million miles away from that idea of the thing that you put underneath the other thing, yeah, or the thing that a thing grows out of. But um, but yeah, slightly different complexion. We then at noun five have um, the smallest kind of cannon used in the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries. So another sense of um, relating to gunnery. And. Uh, the adjective and noun six, we have as basically it's another word for being short, low in height. Um, oh. th this is such a this is such a lovely uh, definition. Having little upward extent, or oh. perhaps outward extent. <laughs> oh, you're not short. You just have very little upward extent. Yeah, very little upward extent. You I can like also. To refer to plants as, as base. They have a low habit of growth. In other words, they don't grow very tall. Right. Um, or a low position, generally speaking, or somewhere that's near to the sea, as in not height, 
not height, not high. <laughs> Seems I've lost the good words. <laughs> and there's a ton of uh, abstract senses, metaphorical senses. And we also get it applying to <clears throat> being low in the social scale. So right, not, yeah. no, not noble, um, lower social classes. That then takes us to the idea that it's something that is of a low or inferior standard. So something that is poor, um, not not good, basically. Um of language, not classical, regarded as less refined than at an earlier stage of development. Now, how long do you think people have been using that particular sense to talk about language? Oh, you know, like that's tough. At a, at a they're blind just not guess, doing it right. I immediately think of sort of probably no earlier than the mid mid to late seventeen hundreds, fifteen forty nine. Wow. So uh, yeah, people have been uh, but... people have been doing the kind of equivalent of grr youngsters um, for as long as people have been writing things down. But Almost. That's, you like know. it's weird to me that people have been being like, you can't use that language because it's not proper since before spelling and grammar were a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like spelling wasn't a thing in the 1500s. You can spell anything any damn way you wanted to. So, so how do they this, judge people? Anyway, people are stupid. <laughs> this this citation, um, a board first book introduction to knowledge. That that's what it seems to to be called. There's a lot, whole lot of, I think, quite unnecessary adjectives going on here. However, this is what it says. It says the speech of England is a base speech to other noble speeches, as Italian, Castilian, and French. Howbeit, the speech of England of late days is amended. In other words, English isn't great, but it was better a long time ago. Right. Yeah. Of course. So that, that's from 1540, around about 1549, there's a suggestion of perhaps 1555, that sort of time. So yeah, nostalgia doesn't go out of fashion. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have this the sense of a base metal, as in um, mixed up with something less valuable, so counterfeit or debased. And the idea of something being cheap or low value, worthless, um, or or indeed morally low, despicable, right. ignoble, reprehensibly cowardly, craven, selfish, mean, um, and and all of these these ideas of of being low down. Of course, because you know history is terrible, we get um, the idea of illegitimacy, so born or occurring out of wedlock. Right. Um, low in a hierarchical classification of the natural world or in the supposed scale of creation. It says, now chiefly historical. Yeah, I wish, dude. <laughs> Unfortunately, people still bring up that shit all over the place. And then there are hundreds and hundreds of compounds um, for, for that particular sense. We get eventually to noun seven. Still on the nouns here. Um, <laughs> which is... Uh, free base as in smoking crack i used to smoke base but that stuff will kill you so right. that comes from the first citation is from 1980 right it was a shortened form of free base right um and then we get to the verbs which again you know nouning verbs and verbing nouns is something that we, we see all the time so we have yeah. um the idea of to lower something to bring or to throw or to lay something down you can lower someone in rank or condition or character. So the idea of debasement mm -hmm. and debasement also of metals. The second verb sense is to run while playing the game of prisoner's bars or prisoner's base. Mm. So um, it's sometimes used as a compound as in to run base. But this idea of, of base as a, a word meaning running, um, although it's obsolete, in the 16th, 17th centuries. That was that was a sense that was being used. Verb three, we get um, to lay, make, or form a foundation for. Again, relating to the sense of the base being the thing that other things are on top of. Right. And then lastly, again, relating back to our latest noun sense, we have base, the verb from 1984. In the middle 70s, cocaine brought a new verb into the English language. That verb is to base. It refers to smoking the free base of cocaine. So, hmm. um, base, taking up a whole lot of real estate in the dictionary. 
let's talk yeah. a little bit about etymology because after all that's why we're here right and uh, etym online has has this to say about it it, it comes to this this sense the bottom of anything considered as its support or foundation or pedestal right and it comes ultimately from a pirate so we get it from old french from latin basis which means foundation which takes us to greek basis which means a stepping or a step that on which one stands or steps a right. pedestal and this word comes, in fact, from the Greek verb by name, which means to go or to walk or to step, which right. in turn comes from the Pi root, gwa, G-W-A, it's written here, which means to go or to come. Oh. I was curious to see that step has had that, that um, the synonyms are... No, that's not the word I'm after. They're not synonyms. They're they're homophones. Um, but the idea of stepping as an action you make with your feet, but also a step <clears> as being <throat> a thing that you have to lift your feet to get over, they're right. you know they're they're etymologically identical. For some reason, I thought there would be some kind of differentiation between the two, and and that's not the case. But well, it's interesting that pedestal also involves feet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like the foot of something. So that's that's cool. How do you? How, how do you notice these chunks of stone? Well, you have to step over them with your feet. So mm. I suppose it, it, it does kind of make sense. Um, gua, obviously to go or to come in any language, um, there's there's a whole lot going on for this. So there's a list of cognates given in Etym Online. There's a list of cognates given um, in the <gasps> University of Texas Austin Linguistics Research Centre into European Lexicon, Pi Etym on an IE Reflexes. <sighs> <laughs> and um and these these cover these cover pretty similar ground so some of the some of the other words that have come into english from this pirate we have words like acrobat advent adventure uh, avenue base and basis become circumvent contravene convenient coven diabetes um eventual intervenient intervention, catabatic. I liked that word. It means of a, of a wind. It means blowing down the hill. Oh, that's cool. Um, misadventure, parvenu, prevenient, prevent, provenance, uh, revenant, souvenir, venue, and welcome. There is, there's a lovely word. that Now, this, this doesn't really have anything directly to do with, with basis okay. um, and basic. One of the cognates is ecbatic. E-C-B-A-T-I-C, -E oh. which I, I'd never seen this word before, so I, I clicked on it. Yeah. And the definition is given as drawn from the relationship of cause and effect, especially of arguments, um, from ek basis or ek basis, um, which means a going out or an issue or event. Again, from by name to go, walk and step, from the pi root gua to come. So very similar, but obviously a very different context, much more Greek looking. But mm. the reason that this kind of stuck in my mind in terms of, of my research is because, you know, if, if you use Etym online at all, and you should because it is an awesome site, um, you, you also get, as it does in the OED, dictionary entries near this word. And at the top of this particular list, near ecbatic, is the word ebriety. Oh. E-B-R-I-E-T-Y. And, and I immediately thought, oh, that looks like the word inebriated. I wonder if it means sobriety. Mm. As in sobriety, ebriety, I wonder if they're the same. And to be inebriated um, right. means to be not ebriated. So I clicked on it <clears throat> and I was completely wrong. In fact... <sighs> Ebriety is the opposite, opposite of, of sobriety. sobriety. It's the so the in and in inebriated is the, like um, having the, like inflammable, like having the nature of being yeah. ebriated. Yeah, so being inebriated is to be in the state of being intoxicated. Right. Um, huh. that, that, was, as is, that, was, that was just a little side note that I, I happened to wander away. It's almost as though I'm not very good at concentrating on one thing at a time. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? Who knew indeed. Um, so a, a long and storied history. 
and it, it has just come back to me as, I, as I've been talking, why it is that I first started researching this word. And in fact, it's, it's a sense that it's entirely possible that I've missed it just because there's just so much in the OED um, for this word. But right. I, I started looking at this word after the concept of the idea of the, the term basic bitch uh, came up in conversation or somewhere or other. I, I don't remember right. where exactly. Yeah. And I, and I found myself wondering what exactly a basic bitch is. And discovered a few interesting things about this term. First of all, it, as I say, it doesn't appear to be in the OED yet, um, which okay. I'm surprised about. I may yeah. just have missed it. Um, because the, the term has actually been around since about 2010 in that part, you know for that particular context yeah now there was a a, a cool a, a cool cool article that i read um online at, at time and time talk about how the phrase first started appearing in hip hop and rap lyrics in 2010 and 2011 to describe a particular kind of fake girl who loves imitation designer handbags. So that's that's kind of how that came about. In the okay. last few years, it's, it's expanded to become an umbrella put down for a conformist girl who wears Uggs, ends her emails with inspirational quotes and sends texts with lots of extra letters. <laughs> <laughs> and um, right. so I, I, I was interested in this term because calling things basic well first of all i found myself wondering where it had come from originally I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second but i was i was wondering if you know the way sometimes pejorative terms kind of have this full circle situation whereby yeah. there's a time when it's kind of cool and trendy to use them and then eventually, like your mum and your grandparents start using them, and then you realise that 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 time has passed. <laughs> yeah, now it's over. Yeah, but but when it is a term that you know specifically refers to the idea of being bland and boring and the same as everyone else. Yeah. Can that ever really go out of style, or it all sort of feels like a self-referential joke about? what this whole term means mm. so the um the, the the article in time is it's kind of about the idea that it's it's called how conformity became a crime oh, okay. um, which i find quite interesting so in terms of who first kind of originated this term boo boo and hiss i feel like you know i feel like women if you want to know what women are like, you should probably talk to some women. That's, you that's know? that seems crazy. Like, like if I wanted to know about killer whales, I would talk to experts on killer whales because I don't speak killer whale. Right. But if I wanted to know about like Spanish people and Spanish culture, I'd probably go and speak to some Spaniards. Right. And I if, mean, I guess, if you want to be really wild and crazy about it. And, you know, like, if, if I wanted to know about what it's like to be a man, I'd probably ask some men about that situation. Right. Um, so, it, you know, life isn't always as nice as that. Let's, let's, uh, <laughs> that was hugely euphemistic, wasn't it? Wow. Yeah. And so I was a bit disappointed to find that basic as, as an insult is once again, um, it seems to have stemmed from men telling women what they can and can't be and what they should and shouldn't be. Right. Ugh, again. Yeah. <laughs> and I I have a real kind of... Um, I, I sort of love the concept of being basic. Like, I I don't know. I, I think that there's something really brilliant. Like, I remember reading a wonderful sort of trashy tabloid news story about a kid who had to go to school dressed up for like culture day some hmm. something like that one of these kind of spurious i don't know like yeah basically the kid's mum was like well i'm american i don't really have a particular heritage or culture to celebrate right what i am is a basic bitch so she sent the little girl 
to school wearing a pair of Ugg boots with her hair in a ponytail with a, a body warmer on and a t-shirt with like a shitty slogan on it. Right. And a big nice. Starbucks cup. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid I, of that. I sort of think that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> and, and of course, everyone was very critical because you shouldn't use the word bitch around little kids and all that sort of stuff. But also the mum was like, well, you know, I'm a basic bitch. So that's my culture. So that was what I thought we would celebrate. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I kind of like this notion of, of saying, well, I'm the same as everybody else and, and I like things that everybody else likes. And that's okay. Right. Because yeah, actually, yeah. the reason that everybody likes things is because usually they're awesome. Some things are just enjoyable. Yeah. Some things are just nice. Um, so so I, I do, I kind of find this term a little bit, a little bit odd and a little bit interesting. And there's, there's lots to say about it. There's, there's lots of, you know, if, if you have a look online, there's a, an article from The Cut, The Basic Bitch, Who Is She? And, um, some of it's really funny. Some of it's quite terrible. But th there was this wonderful quotation that I read that I'm not the same as everybody else is like the catchphrase of the basic bitch. And there's right. just something really endearing to me, this idea that as human beings, we all think we are unique and special, but that right. actually we're all pretty similar. Yeah. Like, for example, during lockdown at one point, I decided I would like to try sewing. I'd never really done this before. I thought I would give it a try. I had lots of time on my hands. So I thought, well, I'll, maybe I'll look and see if I can buy a sewing machine. Guess what? Oh, sold out. Everyone else in the world had the same idea as me. <laughs> yeah. Of course they did. That wasn't a hugely novel <clears throat> idea to have. Right. I have lots of time. Maybe I should take up a hobby that takes up lots of time. What's a popular hobby? Sewing. Yeah. And sewing's awesome for lots of reasons. You can make your own clothes. You can make cool things. Da, 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 da. So, yeah, all sold out because everybody was thinking the same thing as me. There right. I was thinking yeah. about how creative and special and snowflakey I was. No, of course not. I am a human <laughs> being, much the same as all the other human beings. So I like the things that lots of other human beings like at the same time. However, the thing that really, really, really tickled me about the term basic bitch, yeah. this, this made me laugh a whole lot. Now, there's, there's something that I need to check out because it will not surprise you to learn that I am a human being who occasionally edits Wikipedia articles. Okay, yeah. Have we talked the about tracks. this before? I think so. And um, I, I say this, like, it, it's quite a nerdy thing to do, but also... It is that. Wikipedia is awesome. And if I can support it in some small way, then I should. Yeah, I agree but with that. What I found was a very, very funny term, a very, very funny mistake within the Wikipedia article of the word, for the word basic, right? Okay. Because it referred to, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually just checking to see. I so I, I corrected this within within the article, right? But not before I laughed a whole lot because it did say something along the lines of this term has been. It basically it talked about how this term sort of been embraced, and right. it has in fact been used in a satirical context, in an article in the British newspaper, The Guardian, called Why I'm Proud to Be a Basic Bitch. And then it explained that this satirical article is obviously satirical because it's been written by Daisy Buchanan, who is the, you know, one of the major characters in the novel The Great Gatsby, and who could be described as the quintessential basic bitch. Right. And so the satirical article by Daisy Buchanan is about this very thing. Right. Except Daisy Buchanan is a journalist who writes for The Guardian. <laughs> <laughs> She's a, she shares a name with the character from the F. Scott Fitzgerald novel, but she is a real woman who, <laughs> who was, in fact, oh. writing about... Um, the article starts, my name is Daisy and I am a basic bitch. And... <laughs> right. That's so... So I, I, 
I really love the fact that this idea of being basic, as in foundational, yeah. as in the, this this platform center plinth on which we all uh, that that we all kind of grow up from, has become this whole great twisted. It's good, it's bad, you should be called this, you shouldn't be called this. Oh, actually, it's satire. No, it's not. People just tend to be the same. We all need something to grow from, something yeah. to stand on, um, something to, in the sporting case, run towards. And so that's that's basic. That's fantastic. I can't, like, I mean... So, yes, Daisy is a character in Gatsby. Fine. <laughs> But it's not like Daisy Buchanan is a particularly, like, out-of-this-world bizarre name. She's like, not, it's not Olga, like, is she? It's not like somebody, like, penning an article, like a, an op-ed piece under the name of Phineas Fogg or Ford <laughs> Prefect or something. Like, it's not one of those names that you're like, that's obviously a reference to this. Like, Daisy Buchanan, like, those are perfectly ordinary names. Yeah, there are a lot of Buchanans in this part so of the world. To there leap, are a lot of Daisies. To see that in the byline... And then to leap to, clearly that refers to the fictional character from a 1920s F. Scott Fitzgerald novel, and not, oh, look, that person has the same name as the character from Gatsby. <laughs> is, And in the, in the age of the internet, where all you have to do is literally click on the name you're looking at, and yeah. you will pull up a, a bio of that person. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Boy. So but when uh, people have their nerd glasses on. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So Daisy, Daisy Buchanan is proud to be a basic bitch, and uh, as am I. And, um, yeah, it, it's just the idea. I did like, like I, I kind of got where they were coming from because Daisy Buchanan in The Great Gatsby is a super basic bitch. Like she's, oh yeah, in, in the most pejorative terms, she's shallow and she's, you know, disloyal and and she's she's just. But but for me, that that's not it. It's not generally how I perceive that idea. Like. Right. I'm I'm quite happy with the notion that I wanted to buy a sewing machine at the same time as everybody else. You know? Yeah. And sometimes we like to feel like maybe we're 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 different or dare I say it, better. Um mm. but you know, we're 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 all just having the same ideas at the same time, trying to yeah. do the things that everybody else thinks are cool at the same time, joining the same queues, you know, just doing this stuff. Yeah. It's true. Was there any connection? Did you find any, or did you even look at this? This is the first thing I thought of when you started talking about basic and how it's the 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 substructure of a million different things. Was whether that's where basalt got its name? Like that I did sort not of... in any way investigate um, to the interwebs. Like I, I don't know. I don't know, but it. It's it's the you know one Completely of the underlying. Different. It's uh, it it literally literally means very hard stone. It comes from the Greek basanos, meaning touchstone. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Well, there you go. Interesting that asked that the, um, and answered. Yeah, interesting that that you immediately thought of that, and I didn't in the slightest. Suppose you just know more rocks than I do. <laughs> At least one more. <laughs> I'll take it. I'm not like those other guys. I know about rocks. <laughs> Except you are. You're like all those other guys. All Except you're not, but you are kind guys. of. Yeah. Obviously. We are all basic bitches. <laughs> all of us. <laughs> um, neat. My word is thematic, actually. Ooh. Not with basic, but it's because we're coming up on this weekend as we record and when this episode is going to be released tomorrow. Uh, it is Thanksgiving in Canada. Okay. And so our Thanksgiving happens about a month before uh, American Thanksgiving, which is an endless source of cross-border. Pshaw, we have the right one. But in reality, it's simply because Thanksgiving is, like Chuseok in Korea, a harvest festival. And oh. because we live in a, a cold, desolate, broken, lonely land... Our harvest has to happen earlier than the Americans in their stupid, sunny, awesome weather southness. This and doesn't so make good sense. We have it earlier than them, and that's just how it goes. I have just, I've, I've just kind of like 
metaphorically sat down in the cosy armchair, curled up going, oh, I'm going to learn about something <laughs> foreign. <laughs> yes. So my word is harvest. Nice. And this word <laughs> literally woke up, like, I don't even know what time it was. I woke up in the middle of the night, and I was as I was getting back to sleep, the word kind of wafted across my brain. I was like, that'd be a good <laughs> word. I don't know what that is. I have to look that up. That'd be a good word to do for this weekend. And then I went back to sleep and I woke up and went, I knew I had a word <laughs> and I know I should have written it down. And then I spent literally the next two and a half hours just trying to think of like, make any sort of connection to bring it back. And luckily I did. So you and know why I'm laughing up. so hard. I do this sort of shit all the time, which is why I need 22 tabs open on my phone yeah, just exactly. to organize my brain. I should have had another one open with the word saying, <laughs> think of this, look up this word when you wake up, dummy. But I did. And and luckily, I didn't, it wasn't wasted effort trying to remember it because it actually is kind of a cool word. So, because the worst would have been if I looked it up and it was like, oh, that's boring and dumb and I can't talk about that. Yeah, that sucks. Right. But anyway, I think it's kind of neat. So, the the modern sense of the noun, I think, I feel is safe to say is generally accepted as the, like the... Um, the stuff you get off of a farm after growing season is done, right? The harvest. <laughs> the yes, stuff. that's the you technical. The, stuff. the technical agricultural definition for that is the stuff from a farm once it's done becoming stuff. Yes. Um, that sense goes back to the Tyndale Bible in 1526, as far as OED citations goes. So not overly old, but not super young either. The verb form of harvest, i.e. the action of collecting matured crops, etc., uh -huh. goes back to 1400. Okay. So, so far, so good. Um, now, my, without really looking into it sense of like sort of harvest season is that it was just sort of a, a catch-all term for generally the autumn or mid-autumn, early autumn because that's when people do their harvesting. That's like, when the stuff is ready. Ready. That's when the stuff fully becomes stuff. Um, <laughs> it is entirely in stuffinated. Yes. Oh, and stuffinated is great. <laughs> um, however, the noun form of harvest is way older than the what was picked after the growing season sense of harvest. And in fact, it goes back to and this is weirdly specific for the OED in this era, 902. Oh, in the that is Code exciting. Yeah, in the Codex Diplomaticus IV Saxonici, which is a collection of Anglo-Saxon documents that was compiled in the mid-1800s. And so it goes back to the year 902. I don't know how they did it. I'm presuming it had a date on it, on the document itself, which is kind of neat. <laughs> it's 902, stupid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But in the year 902, in this citation, it originally, the definition for harvest noun was the third season of the year, or the autumn. Oh, okay. So, and it, incidentally on this point, um, the word season comes up a lot, and we did the word season in episode 38, and it's one of my favorite, like seasoning and seasoned and all that stuff was one of my favorite etymologies that I've gotten to learn through doing this, so... If you're looking for that, episode 38, which I was astonished to realize was three and a half years ago. Shut up. <laughs> right? Wow. That doesn't make any sense. It just does not. I so, demand a recount. Yeah, that's right. So I thought that was kind of cool that harvest the stuff off a farm or the action of getting stuff off a farm came from the name of the season when that thing happened yeah. as opposed to the other way around. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was a bit I of would a very much have expected it to be the other way around. Upside downness. Now, to be fair, it wasn't all that long before the OED has a sense where it's like the time of year when you take stuff that's finished growing out of the ground, finally. Mm -hmm. But it was a couple hundred years. So the OED's 902, year 902 definition is uh, defined as the third of the four seasons of the year, the autumn. And the second sense, which starts showing up around 1100, was the season for reaping and gathering of the ripened grain. So it's not miles away, and it's not that long. You know, in the first, the latter, ha the last chunk of the first millennium, 200 years, as far as written sources, is not actually 
as mu- nearly as much time as it is between like 1600 and 1800. Yeah. Like yeah if I mean, you have a sense that shows up at 1600 and this other sense that doesn't show up to 1800, you could be pretty positive that it, it that r- more roughly translates into a, when the word actually started becoming commonly used. It is interesting, isn't it? Because like etymology is of course a a science, but it's a super non-scientific science. And I, I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure there are people out there who would argue with that that point of oh, view, yeah. but 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 what I mean is, you know, you can empirically measure years and time, but sometimes 200 years in in etymological terms is a long time, and sometimes it's not a long time, because yeah. you you absolutely can say, you know, as, as they do in the OED, this word first shows up in a written citation in exactly this year, and 200 years later it shows up again, and it seems to mean the same thing, but you you're not taking into account the huge cultural usage, human beings are lazy, all that kind of extra baggage that that actually has just as much meaning for what that word means and how it's used and who's using it and why yeah. they're using it. You know, it's it's really interesting. Like I, I often I often think this when I'm researching or when I when I'm talking about words, like I wonder how much time that actually was because some periods of history are very, very full of historical events and some not so much. And that sounds like a ridiculous thing to say because obviously every event that happens in the past is a historical event. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But, But not every historical event will have the kind of impact on language that the Norman Conquest had or that, you know, the you know, the invention of the printing press had, or, or, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good way to measure things, but it's not a great way to measure always. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fair. I think it's fair to say that change happened slower for most of human history than it has in the last 200 years. Oh God, yeah. Like things, if you were, if you were a person who was alive in the year 850 or a person who was alive in the year 1050, your life was probably very similar between those two people. Yeah. Like there wasn't, wouldn't, it wouldn't have been a, a huge amount of difference necessarily, as opposed to someone born in, well, certainly 1800 versus the year 2000. Like, I mean, I remember, I remember seeing a wonderful um, sort of statistic. Maybe that's, maybe that's a, a bit of a, an over exaggeration, but it was about how much written, word a person would consume how much written word i'm doing the good wording again (laughs) and how how many written words a person would consume and and be exposed to yeah in like 1850 compared to 1900 and you know that that's that's a relatively short period of time in etymological Mm. in an etymological sense but you know when people were able to read when everyone was able to read, you know, when literacy became a thing that, and again, like all of that stuff is like, what is literacy? How does it happen? Why does it happen? All of those things that there's such a huge, rich cultural picture behind all of that stuff yeah. that, that says who gets the words and who doesn't get the words and how they get the words. Mm-hmm. That, um, yeah, I mean, it's one of the reasons why etymology is so vast and thicket like and fascinating. Yeah, but but sometimes it would be nice to be able to say, and that was two hundred years ago, and that means this. It's not always the case. <laughs> yeah. So, and and also just the, the other thing is just how much how much writing was being done just in general, like yeah, how much language, what proportion of language in use at the time ended up on a page was vastly it was a vastly smaller proportion than than it eventually became. Yeah. So the idea that like if it was much, it would have been much harder for a word to have existed for a hundred years without being written down ever in the 1800s, as opposed to the 800s. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's, that's, I think that's another reason why we kind of go, eh, if it doesn't show up for another hundred years, it might just been because there were only eight books between those two centuries. (laughs) And then that makes sense why there weren't very many. What are those 12 writing dudes? Yeah. They just didn't get around to it. (laughs) 
<laughs> <laughs> I mean, both authors could have missed it for a hundred years, and that's fine. <laughs> like, so, uh, I feel yeah. I I feel I once again need to just with all this chat about uh, availability of words, I, I must once again impress upon you the importance that you read the assembly of the the severed head by Hugh Lipton. Right. I yes. I must have talked about this book before. Oh yeah, I, definitely. Yeah, I, I, yeah, but please, if if you're at all interested in the notion of who writes things down and why and and how that comes to be, just it's such a wonderful book. That's neat. I will have to check that out. But it, either way, whether it's a huge amount of time or not, it still seems interesting to me that even though it was only two hundred years before it switched from just meaning the autumn to meaning the season when stuff gets pulled out of the field. It's still interesting to me that it was another three centuries until you get to the 1500s or the 1400s for the verb that it primarily talked about the action or the stuff being pulled out of the field. It was always yeah. the season first, which was counterintuitive to me anyway. Yeah, very much so. Or did it? <gasps> because one of... Uh, one of the best parts about this season and holiday for me is all the pie you get to eat. So now we get to have some. So, but before we got all the way back to Proto-Indo-European, which is what we mean when we say pie, is uh, the word was Germanic in origin, of course, because we're in the 10th century. Um, all the major players, Frisian, Low High Old German, Old Norse, Middle Dutch, etc., have an equivalent, uh, an equivalent to harvest. All roughly meaning the same thing. Nope. But before all that, um, Edam Online posits that it came from a pie root uh spelled k-e-r-p which i i know we have this conversation a lot about whether it's even remotely possible to arrive at a correct pronunciation of proto-indo-european but for this one for me it only makes me think of rory mccann's amazing character from hot fuzz michael someone where Herp. all he said was yarp <laughs> And then there was the one glorious time when he was at when Simon Pegg was impersonating him and he was asked a question where the negative answer and he went, Narp and it worked and it was he was really excited for it. But so to me this uh, one is just, Carp. Ju just to say, Yarp and Narp are well used words in this household. Um, I certainly hope so. Because we're chumps, but but yeah, Yarp and Narp, very much so. We so like good. those words. Carp. So for me that yeah, that was Kerp. Um <laughs> So that's the pie root that it comes from. Uh, now, the, the OED, for its part, uses the word perhaps as a qualifier. So perhaps okay. it's connected to a pie root, and they use it as harb, H-A-R-B. Okay. Now, the University of Texas at Austin Linguistics Research Center Indo-European Lexicon Picorni Master Pie Edema <sighs> has neither of those pie roots listed in it at all. And I went, oh. But the American Heritage Dictionary, Yay. Uh, Indo European Roots Appendix, does. And it uses the CURP term. So we have a couple of fun cognates that I would, would not have ever connected to this. Um, but if you stop and have a good think about it, shout out to all those No More Jockeys fans out there. Um, excerpt and carpet are both cognates of this because they come from the Latin carpere, meaning to pluck. Because that uh kerp means to pluck gather or harvest and this is also okay. where you get carpe from carpe diem is to to pluck or to seize, seize or to gather or to grab all right yeah so carpets are plucked they're yeah because you kind of pluck thread the through fibers. a base thing yeah. to make pull them up and make a carpet and then to to an excerpt is a, a bit of text or a bit of something that's plucked, plucked from the overall context oh, and nice. uh yeah. So, in summary, uh, harvest referred to the season before it meant the stuff gathered from a farm, but ultimately probably meant the action of gathering stuff from a farm centuries or more before it meant the season when you gather stuff from a farm. <laughs> Is that... I'm... Yeah. We do this We do this podcast to inform people, so that's good. <laughs> so, yeah. That's super cool. 
So harvest was both before and after the season, but also the getting stuff from a farm. Also, because I want to choose violence in this Thanksgiving season, I'm going to just go on record saying that pumpkin pie is gross. There, I said it. So I... Um, we, we don't get extra pie at this time of year, particularly. Uh, in, That's in sad. In part of the world. Because eating... I mean, pumpkin pie isn't a thing here at all. Oh, that's super. You'd have to go out of your way to find it. You, I mean, to be honest, and like, shout out to all the plant-eating people out there who maybe have a different experience of this, but I live in Scotland and we only see pumpkins because, like, traditionally in Scotland, jack-o'-lanterns are made out of turnip. Sorry, say that again? Jack-o'-lanterns, you know, the carved yeah. face... They are made from turnips. Huh. So I had never seen a pumpkin until I was about 25 because they, they didn't really, they, they weren't really a thing. Oh, wow. And you didn't get them in the supermarket. I mean, you do now. Now you get you get pumpkins in the supermarket around right. about this time of year and yeah. people carve pumpkins. But okay. like, when I was a little kid, that, that was not particularly a thing that happened because traditionally you made your your uh, jack-o'-lanterns from turnip heads. Now, I don't know what your uh, I don't know, don't know what your general experience of turnip is, but my God, it's a hard thing to cut. <laughs> well, I was gonna say, and also it's it's just solid all the way through. Yep. <laughs> like it's how the hell do you do that? You get a really sharp knife, and you have a lot of persistence and perhaps some violence. Good grief! And these are my people, and this is my country. Well, I mean, I was gonna say yes. <laughs> If but I... <laughs> but, um, but yeah, as and as much as now pumpkins are a thing that you can buy in the supermarket at this time of year, I don't know anyone who actually eats the shit. <laughs> like, you know, people buy pumpkins, yeah. they carve lanterns, they throw away a whole lot of orange goo, and then after a week or so, they throw away the shell, d d depleted of orange goo and smelling a bit funky. Yeah, so, I, I don't I, much like pumpkin in general, well, but pumpkin seeds can be a nice little... I, I have you to point out that there, yeah. I, I do, I very much do like pumpkin. And oh, I really? discovered this in Korea when I was taken by probably an employer, I, f I forget who it was. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody took me to a restaurant as like a nice, let's go out for dinner kind of thing. And right. they took us to a Hoback restaurant. Hoback yeah. means pumpkin in Korean. And everything, every course we ate had pumpkin in it, fairly prominently. Yeah. Um, and I'd certainly never really considered it as a sweet thing because of not experiencing pumpkin pie. And you you could buy pumpkin toffee. Do you, do you remember this? In the supermarket in Korea. Yeah. Which was actually pretty good. So so since then, I, I'm a lot more kind of pumpkin aware and indeed pumpkin friendly. I would totally <laughs> I'd try the, the life out of pumpkin pie because I like dessert and I like pumpkin. So it's, it's probably a good thing for me. Yeah, you'd probably be into it. But um, but yeah, I, I don't have any particular skin in the pumpkin pie is or isn't good game because mm. I've I've never ever tried it. Interestingly, harvest makes me think of of one thing in particular. Okay. And uh, when I was when I was young and had no sense, um, <laughs> right. that's, that's a period that encompasses uh, so much time <laughs> and so much nonsense. Yeah. Um, but I I used to be an organist and I started off sort of. My sister had a job playing the organ and she went off to university and I kind of inherited it. I didn't really right. want to play the organ. I wanted to play the piano, but nobody was offering me cash to do that. So I yeah. started playing the organ in the Catholic church that my family went to. And then when I was about 17, I was offered a job in a, an Anglican church, an Episcopal church, playing the organ there, which was like much more kind of classical organ step up in both musical quality and difficulty, had to get special lessons, all that chat. And they wanted me to take over from the guy who was, he was leaving to go somewhere else. And it was right. a bit like, can we take this person who's never done this thing before and in a relatively short period of time, have her ready to play Sunday services, which are musically quite demanding. Right. The answer was yes, somehow. And hmm. the very first Sunday that I played at that particular church with that particular mode of church music was Harvest Sunday. Oh, good. So, um, so the the Harvest and Harvest Sunday is a super British affair. 
In fact, I'd I'd go a little bit further than that. I would say it's a super English affair, um, and the hymns have been the same for the last hundred years at least, maybe more. So in in pretty much any Church of Scotland, Church of England, uh, Episcopal type setting, people will be singing "We Plough the Fields and Scatter." They will be singing. Um, Oh, sudden mind blank. Da 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 da. You know, it's it's a very very kind of traditional. You only get to wheel these hymns out once a year, kind of situation. Yeah, yeah. And so so you play them. You play them every year, and plow the fields and scatter the good seed on the land and all that stuff. But um, yeah, it's a that's that's really cool. It totally like bizarrely didn't occur to me that harvest was a season as well as an action until mm. you started talking about it. But of course it is. Harvest season. Yeah. So there you go. Cool. What a basic harvest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't think of that. That's good. And that's it for another episode of Lexitecture. To get in touch with us about something you heard in this episode, you can email us at words at lexitecture.com. You can also follow along and talk to us at Lexitecture on Facebook and Twitter and at Lexitecture Podcast on Instagram. For back episodes and the occasional blog post, visit us at lexitecture.com. Thanks very much, and we'll talk to you again soon. Bye. <laughs>